All right, in this video, we're gonna talk about specimen preparation. Um, and we're gonna talk about it in the context of preparing something for light microscopy. Um, and I'm gonna divide this up in the first module here, we're gonna talk about sectioning and mounting, and then we'll move on to the other uh, types of sections and, and further uh, modules. So just overall, uh, specimen preparation is important uh, because if we don't prepare something well, then that's going to inhibit the characterization we can do uh, to it, right? So we have to have a very good way of preparing samples to look at for the light microscope. So metallurgists uh, have developed extensive kind of sets of techniques for examination of metallic specimens. Uh, these can also be applied to other types of materials, ceramics, polymers, uh, but oftentimes there has to be modifications. So there's lots of techniques out there you can typically find for a material that you're interested in. But what I want to do first is go over the main steps. So these are often going to be the main steps that we see when we're talking about specimen preparation. So number one, we're going to have sectioning. So this is where we generate a cross-section. So this assumes that we want to look at a cross-section of the material. If we wanted to look at a surface or anything else, then obviously this would not be necessary. So this is where we generate a cross-section if we want to look at the internal structure. All right, two, mounting. So mounting uh, is embedding specimen into some type of regular shape. And again, this isn't uh, absolutely necessary, but it allows us to more easily do the preceding steps. So we want to do this in order to have a really nice shape that can be used in a lot of automated processes. Uh, and this helps just in general to make it ease uh, of hand handling. So mounting. Uh, three, grinding. All right, so this is where we flatten. Uh, specimen, the specimen we have, and remove any damage from sectioning or anything else. So sectioning can often be very um, uh, rough uh, and produce a lot of damage on the cut surface, and so this will flatten it and remove that damage, uh, scratches, and so forth. Uh, sort of a continuation of that, we have polishing. So this gives us a flat, so continues giving us flat, but also gives us scratch free surfaces. So we're usually not interested in looking at the scratches uh, because that's from the, the preparation steps itself. So we want to get rid of that with polishing. All right. And uh, a last step, and keep in mind that if you are doing a very specific type of uh, specimen preparation, you may not have all of these or they may, may be slightly modified, but this is just a general set of steps that, that we have. So the last step is etching, and so we produce a flat scratch-free surface, so that doesn't give us much to look at, it's just a mere finish. And so we have etching, which is a chemical method to generate const contrast between different features that we're looking at. So the common one here um, is grains and grain boundaries. So if we want to be able to look at the grain structure, how large what shape the grains are in. If we have a chemical method, some type of you know acid or so forth that can etch 
one of those at a faster rate than the other, then this will give us a contrast when we're viewing it under the microscope. So these are kind of the, the steps, the common steps in what we call metallography, uh, if it's you know from a metals background, but this is our sample or specimen preparation. So I will uh, mention again in the lecture notes, um, I put a, a single link up there, uh, which is from one of the metallography companies. They sell a lot of uh, pol uh, grinders, polishers, etchants, things like that. Uh, and they have some of these uh, procedures and techniques that can be used for specific materials and depending on what you're looking for. So I put the link there. You can find additional information. Um, also, if you are aware of other uh, companies that, that sell this type of equipment, they will often have similar techniques for specimen preparation on their websites or uh, booklets that you can uh, obtain from them. All right. Let's look at that first step, sectioning. So we talked about one of the reasons why we want to section, and that's to generate a cross section. Uh, but it can also be used and commonly uh, done to reduce the size. So if we have, depending on what our specimen uh, size is originally, we can use sectioning to give a smaller piece. And so that's because a large uh, specimen is not going to fit under the microscope. All right, so the most common type of sectioning that we have is abrasive cutting. So this is the most common type. So all this really is is typically we would have a, a disc, a cutting disc, uh, that's powered by a motor. And this would be some type of uh, abrasive material. So we have a thin disc. Uh, and it has abrasive particles. And so one of the common types is silicon carbide. Silicon carbide is a very hard material um, used as an abrasive, uh, oftentimes in um, sandpaper, things like that. So we can make that into a disc by uh, supporting it uh, with media. So this could be rubber, resin, uh, or something else. So something that basically binds these particles together. So basically we make a disc uh, out of abrasive particles uh, and it's held together by something uh, and this is used as a cutoff. So this wheel is going to turn and uh, we are going to grind our specimen. So I'll just, you know, this is our specimen down here. And so this allows us to cut that sample by slowly grinding it uh, away. Um, so some notes about this process. So it typically requires cooling. So if we're cutting into the specimen with these particles, it's going to generate a lot of heat and that can ruin or alter the structure. And so to maintain the, the structure that we have, we want to cool it. And so typically that's going to be with some type of uh, coolant, some liquid, uh, water, oil, something like that, that's going to prevent uh, excessive heating. Um, so also one thing to consider here is whatever the coolant is, um, you want to uh, usually use something, something that's going to inhibit rust. So if we just use water, for example, uh, that can cause rusting if our specimen is uh, ferrous. So the abrasive cutting uh, is really good for sectioning large specimens quickly. Um, and you know, d basically these, these discs spin around at very high speeds and allow for very quick cuts. So it's good for a uh, very rough cut. Uh, the, the, sam the, the surface can be uh, a little bit rough, uh, but you can take care of that with the uh, grinding and polishing. Uh, but it's really good for those types. If you need a very precise cut, 
Uh, these are not good. These uh, we, uh, discs, as you might imagine, have to be rather rather thick to stay together. And so if we need a very thin uh, cross-section or if we need a very precise location, uh, abrasive cutting usually isn't the answer. So uh, not the most precise. All right. So for, for that type of work, then we need uh, what we call precise cutting. And with that, we're going to talk about two types, uh, a diamond saw, and then we're also going to talk about uh, electric machine, electric discharge, excuse me, machine. And this is EDM. All right, now let's talk a little bit about this diamond saw. So this is, again, a precise instrument, more so than the uh, abrasive uh, cutoff saw. Um, and it's very similar in design to the abrasive. Um, abrasive saw. So in the abrasive saw, you use something like silicon carbide, and that's uh, blended together with the media uh, and held together. Um, here, this uh, diamond saw is very similar, except we have a uh, cutting wheel. Uh, and it has small diamond particles. So basically, instead of silicon carbide, we have diamond. Um, and uh, that this diamond is basically put onto uh, a metallic wheel. Um, so you still need uh, cutting media, something that's going to cool it down, right? Um, however, you have uh, a, a much lower rotational speeds. So you're going to get much slower cutting. But um, this is uh, really well suited for brittle materials. So brittle materials don't do well with typical abrasive uh, cutting uh, because they can crack. So here for ceramics uh, and other brittle materials, um, this diamond cutting is very good. And again, uh, not only this, but it's also if we need a very precise cut. So we need to know exactly where that location is going to be, uh, or if we need a very thin cut. The diamond saw is really well suited for that. All right, the other form of precise cutting that we're going to talk about is EDM. Uh, so I put you the little joke there that um, this is not uh, <laughs> electronic dance music. Um, this is electronic discharge machining or EDM. Um, so again, this is a precise tool and the way it works is that we have um, a discharge between uh, an electrode and the specimen. So here's our electrode in this machine and then this is our specimen. So because of this, uh, we can only use conductive uh, specimens for EDM. So that's a limitation of this. But if we have an electro, uh, a uh, conductive, electronically conductive material, uh, we can use this. And so we have the specimen, it's inside this uh, dielectric fluid, and then electrode uh, and our specimen acts as the other uh, electrode, uh, and this basically provides a spark. And this is what's used to cut. So it, basically that arcing uh, causes erosion or melting uh, between the area of electrode. And this is a very thin, fine area. So we can really well control uh, what this is. And we can even do interesting shapes if you want and so forth. Uh, but this is uh, how this works. Basically electronic, um, uh, using electrodes and uh, conductive material. Um, so if we do have this melting, we can have a, a, a recast, so if it re-solidifies uh, on the cut surface, we can have this re, what's called a recast layer. And so obviously this would need to be removed 
uh, with the further processing, so grinding and polishing. Uh, but it does give uh, a very precise cut like the diamond saw. But again, exclu uh, basically exclusive for conductive materials. All right, the, the last uh, precise uh, cutting mechanism I want to talk about is called microtomy. So this is uh, this refers to the sectioning of materials with a knife. So it's it's a it can be a very simple technique. If you had, for example, a razor blade, uh, you can section off a piece from a material, and that would be called microtomy. Um, however, what this is typically used for is this is common. Uh, for preparing biologicals, biological specimens, um, and soft materials, such as polymers So the very common technique uh, for those biologicals or, or soft materials. Um, so that knife could be uh, tool steel, uh, tungsten carbide, diamond, or glass. So there are lo there's lots of different kind of knife arrangements. So ultra, uh, sorry, microtomy is uh, a version of this where we use this knife. Um, ultra microtomy is going to be a subset, and we're going to talk about this later when we get to transmission electron microscopy, because this will give us really thin specimens. Um, this microtomy can give us thin sections, but ultra microtomy is on the uh, nanometer scale for uh, electron microscopy. So that's just a subset that we'll talk about later uh, when we get to TEM. All right. So let's now go ahead and talk about the next step in our sequence, which is mounting. So again, as I mentioned before, this is the idea of embedding a specimen into a material, another material. And so the mounting material, what encapsulates our material is something such as a thermoset polymer. And so the reason we do this is for ease of processing. So we've just sectioned off a small piece, so maybe a little rectangle, and we can put it inside of a thermoset polymer. So this is our specimen. This is the thermoset. And so we do this so that it has a very regular shape. So either if you're using your hand for the later steps, that you can hold it very easily and comfortably, or it's a regular shape uh, because there are a lot of automated machines that require a very specific shape uh, for those processes. So the, that's a couple of reasons we do this uh, mounting step. Again, you don't necessarily have to. If you can hold the material yourself, that's fine. But practically speaking, you, you wanna have this so it's much easier and you get to do a better job of this. Okay, so um, there's two types. There is hot mounting. So this is where we have that section piece. Uh, we place it in a die uh, and we cover it with a polymeric material. And then we apply temperature and pressure to set it. So let me just sort of draw you a schematic of this. So this is our die. Uh, we often have little heating elements inside to heat it up. Uh, we have a bottom piece, which is a metal piece that just holds everything together. We place our specimen. So that's our sp specimen. And then we pour in a powder, a polymeric powder. So all of this around it is that thermoset polymer. And then we put another 
piece on top of it, um, another metal piece most likely, and we apply pressure and heat. So for example, this might be 150 degrees Celsius for about 10 minutes. That's a pretty standard uh, configuration uh, at a specific pressure. And what that does is that heat and pressure will set So the heat plus the pressure set the thermoset polymer. And that polymer uh, is often something like a phenolic resin. Uh, Bakelite is an example of that. So those are just a couple types that, that we can have. All right, so as you can imagine from this, uh, there are going to be some of your specimens that maybe will be affected by a temperature of 150 C. So hot melting uh, is not suitable for low temperature materials. So we're probably not gonna use a polymer, or if our specimen's a polymer, we're probably not gonna use this method um, to mount the material because it will be affected by the 150 degrees C. And so in those cases, what we're going to use is cold mounting. So in this case, uh, the same idea, we have a mold just like we did before. This is our mold. Uh, you know, something in the bottom as well. So I'll just draw it like this. Uh, we place our specimen. And then we have some type of castable liquid. This is often a polymer resin. This could be epoxy. It could be acrylic. Uh, it could also be a polyester. All of these are commercially available and used. So we pour that in, um, and uh, this is uh, typically at room temperature, and we cast it, and uh, typically for that resin, it will be a uh, two-part, so it'll be um, a resin plus what we call a hardener, so the chemical that causes it to cross-link. And so we do that at a specific ratio and it will cure. So cure time can be five minutes, as low as five minutes, uh, but it can also be much uh, up to hours. So um, cure times, the uh, five minute, on the five minute side, acrylics are very fast, so they can be down to five minutes, whereas epoxies and polyesters tend to go up uh, in the hours. Um, uh, a couple things to note here is that uh, even though this is done at room temperature, the reaction, the uh, two part, the resin plus hardener, that chemical reaction that cross -links, links it is exothermic. And so even though we have it at room temperature, it may be slightly higher. So we need to still consider that if we have very sensitive uh, materials. And so oftentimes we can immerse this in something like uh, in, in water to, to prevent uh, excess heat. So we can sort of uh, cool it in that, in that way. All right, so just some general notes now, just to leave us off here. Um, so the specimen in most cases is harder than the mount. So that's something that we have to consider. So this can lead to uh, heterogeneous grinding and polishing, the next steps where the mount polishes uh, or grinds faster than the specimen. So that's something that we have to consider. 
Uh, we can also get uh, edge rounding, which is what it sounds like, the, the, uh, the edges round off. And so um, oftentimes additives can be added. So these uh, might uh, help the mount material harden uh, to a higher degree and be closer to the hardness um, of the specimen. Um, so the, those are the two types of mounting that are most common, but I do want to mention here, just at the, at the last, uh, that there are some less commonly used, um, less common So we could just uh, do mechanical clamping. So this is what it sounds like. We have some type of, um, if we have a, a thin sheet, for example, uh, it's clamped into place by something else. So it's just held together to another material. So we can use clamping. Um, we could also use an adhesive. So this is where we have a specimen and we, you know, basically glue it or tape it to another material. Um, and also, lastly, um, we can use vacuum impregnation. So these two are less common. They may just be used if you have very specific uh, size material or you're just doing one sample and you don't have one of these machines. Uh, vacuum impregnation is useful for porous specimens. So if you have a very porous specimen, we can use vacuum impregnation, which is going to be just like if I go back here to the cold mounting. So it's basically identical to this. So you do everything you did here, but right when you uh, pour the castable resin uh, around the, the porous specimen, what we do is we put that all in a vacuum chamber. So it's basically cold mounting plus a vacuum chamber. And so what that does is having it in the vacuum chamber forces that liquid into all the pores. It basically forces all the air out of the pores and the liquid into it. So that's the idea uh, of this technique. So if, you, if we basically need to fill all of those crevices and, and pores, we can use this vacuum to do that. But it's very similar to uh, cold mounting.